to the script. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Neville Gardner and as chair of the company, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the 10th annual general meeting of shareholders of Proteomics International Laboratories. It's now after 9.30 a.m. And as we have a, a quorum of shareholders present, I declare the meeting open. Uh, we've got a slightly uh, longer formal business than we traditionally have had, so unfortunately I'm not going to be able to set a record on behalf of everyone. Um, but we'll do our best to work our way through it. There are some very important items in here that we do need to give them due attention. The notice convening today's meeting was made available to shareholders on the 9th of October and lodged with ASX on that date. Consequently, I will take the notice as read. Uh, first of all, let me introduce the members of the board, if they're somehow not known to you just yet. Um, uh, we've got Dr Richard Lipscomb, our Managing Director, Dr James Williams on the end, He's Deputy Chairman and Mr Paul House, Non-Executive Director. We're also uh, joined by Mr Aaron Brinkworth, who will be appointed to your board at the conclusion of this meeting over there. Um, also present here today is Mr James Massey-Taylor, representing BDO, our independent auditor. And I'd also like to welcome and acknowledge the many Proteomics team members that are here with us today. Apologies have been received from Mr Roger Moore, Non-Executive Director, who will be retiring at the end of this meeting and Karen Logan, Company Secretary, both of whom are presently overseas, not together, and unable to attend the meeting today. Although they are in the same country, but they assure us it's coincidental. Uh, Richard will speak in more detail to the company's achievements in FY24 and our plans for FY25 in his presentation after the conclusion of the formal items of business. I would like to take this opportunity to thank Dr. Robin Elliott, who retired from the board on the 12th of August this year, and Roger Moore, who retires at the end of this meeting for their significant contributions to the company during their tenure and wish them well in their future endeavours. While we will certainly miss the wise counsel and insights of Robin and Roger, we are delighted that we've been able to attract two new members to the board of the calibre of James and Aaron. Their skills and experience are of great value to our company as we embark on the next exciting chapter of our growth. As announced recently at the conclusion of this meeting, I will hand over to the chairman role to James, and I look forward to supporting his board leadership at this important time, and we'll give James an opportunity to speak uh, to the meeting at the conclusion of the formal business. On behalf of the board, I would like to thank Richard and the entire Proteomics team for their continuing professionalism and dedication. Their hard work has the potential to fundamentally improve millions of lives. I'd also like to thank all our shareholders for their continuing support. I will now turn to the formalities of the meeting. Upon registering for the meeting today, you will have received an attendance and voting card. If anyone believes they are entitled to vote in any capacity and does not have an attendance and voting card, please raise your hand now and Julio Bella from Autonomic will assist you. Everyone said, thank you. We will attend to the items of business as set out in the agenda contained in the notice of meeting. Shareholders will be given the opportunity to ask questions specific to each resolution before it is voted on. Please raise your hand to do so at the appropriate time and state the name for the record. As I said, after conclusion of formalities, our Managing Director will be giving a presentation on the company, which will provide some insights on the highlights, achievements and forward plans for the company, following which questions may be put to all the directors. The minutes of the previous annual general meeting of Proteomics, which was held on 23 November 2023, were approved by the board and signed by the chairman of that meeting. The original minutes are tabled and are available for inspection should any member wish to see them. I have made rulings on the appointment of proxies and confirmed that all valid proxies have been recorded, tabled and are open for inspection. Proxies have been received from 114 shareholders for a total of 43,173,155 shares, representing approximately 33% of the company's issued capital. The proxy votes for each resolution will be displayed on the screen and as such, I will not read out the proxy position as we deal with each resolution. Where proxies have been nominated to be at the chairman's discretion, as advised in the notice of meeting, those votes will be cast in favour of the resolution. In accordance with current practice, Proteomics will be conducting polls for each of the resolutions at today's meeting. The polls will be conducted at the end of the meeting. We will now move to the items of business. I refer you to the first item of business as set out in the notice of meeting and as displayed, which is to receive and consider the financial report for the year ended 30 June 24, together with the directors and auditors reports. Are there any questions or comments on the financial report? No, thank you. Uh, 
Thank you. As this matter does not require a vote, we'll move on to the first resolution. Resolution one is the remuneration report, and as set out in the noting as displayed is to adopt that remuneration report for the year end of June 24. I note that the vote on this matter is considered to be advisory only. The Corporations Act provides for the two strikes rule, requiring a board's bill if the report sees two no votes of 25% or more over two consecutive years. No strike was recorded at last year's AGM. No member of Proteomics Key Management personnel or their closely related parties is permitted to vote on the resolution. The proxy votes received in relation to this resolution are as displayed. Any questions on the resolution? As there are no questions, and since we are conducting polls on each of the resolutions at the end of the meeting, we will now move to the next item of business. I now refer you to resolution two, as set out in the notice of meeting and as displayed, which is to re-elect James Williams as a director of the company. The notice of meeting includes details of Dr. Williams' background and experience in industry, and I note that the board recommends the re-election of Dr. Williams as a director of the company. The proxy votes received in relation to this resolution are as displayed. Any questions on this resolution? As I said, uh, James will speak to everyone at the conclusion of the formal part of the business. Thank you. As there are no questions, we will now move to the next item of business. As I am subject to the next resolution, I will hand over the chair to James. Thank you, Neville. I now refer you to resolution three, as set out in the notice of meeting and as displayed, which is to re-elect Neville Gardner as a director of the company. The notice of meeting includes details of Mr. Gardner's background and experience in the industry, and I note that the board recommends the re-election of Mr. Gardner as a director of the company. Again, the proxy votes received in relation to this resolution are displayed. Are there any questions or comments in relation to the resolution? As there are no questions, um, I will now hand the chair back to Neville. Thank you, James. I now re refer you to resolution four as set out in the notice of meeting and as displayed, which is to confirm the appointment of BDO Audit Proprietary Limited as Audit for the company. A change of audit entity occurred in May due to the national integration of BDO and resolution four seeks approval to confirm the appointment of BDO Audit. The, po the proxy votes received in relation to this resolution are as displayed. Any questions on this resolution? As there are no questions, we will now move to the next item of business. I now refer to resolution five as set out in the notice of meeting and as displayed, which is to ratify the prior issue of 8.5 million shares pursuant to ASX listing rule 7.1 under an institutional placement which raised $6.5 million in January of this year. Jefferies Australia Proprietary Limited acted as lead manager of the placement. The proxy votes received in relation to this resolution are as displayed. Are there any questions or comments on this resolution? No, thank you. As there are no questions, we will now move to the next item of business. I now refer you to resolution six as set out in the notice of meeting and as displayed, which is to approve the issue of 2.6 million executive options to managing director, Dr. Richard Lipscomb, or his nominee as a long-term incentive under the terms of his executive services agreement. The executive options will vest over 24 months, have varying exercise prices per tranche between $1.50 and $3.50, and have expiry dates of three or four years from the date of issue. The Black-Scholes valuation determined the fair value of the options to be $439,552. The directors, other than Dr Lipscomb, have determined that the value of executive options constitutes reasonable remuneration in the circumstances and the directors believe that the proposed grant of executive options provides cost-effective remuneration as the non-cash form of this benefit will allow the company to spend a greater proportion of its cash reserves on its operations than it would if alternative cash forms of remuneration were given to Dr Lipscomb. Proxy votes received in relation to this resolution are as displayed. Are there any questions or comments on this resolution? As there are no questions, comments will now move to the next item of business. I now refer you to resolution seven as set out in the notice of meeting and as displayed, which is to approve the issue of 250,000 director options to non-executive director, James Williams or his nominee. The director op options have varying exercise prices of $1.50 and $2.50 and have expiry dates of three and four years from the date of issue. A Black-Scholes valuation determined the fair value of the options to be $46,267. 
the directors other than Dr Williams have determined that the value of the direction options constitutes reasonable remuneration in the circumstances and believe that the proposed grant of the options provides cost-effective remuneration um, as it, again, allows us to spend more cash on the operations of the business uh, than alternative forms of remuneration. The pro proxy votes received in relation to this resolution are as displayed. Are there any questions or comments on this resolution? Thank you. As there are no comments or questions, we will now move to the next item of business. Um, resolutions 8 and 9 are they're separate resolutions, but they do sort of operate in conjunction with each other and once necessary um, follows the first. I now refer to a resolution ACE is set out in the notice of meeting and as displayed, which, to, which is to approve the increase the, of the maximum number of options that may be issued in accordance with ASX listing rule 7.2. Exception 13B under the company's employee incentive options plan from the present maximum of 6,110,000 options to a maximum of 22,690,407 options without impacting the company's 15% placement capacity during the three year period following approval by shareholders at this AGM. The company is at a critical stage of growth as it seeks to bring its pipeline of new novel diagnostics tests exemplified by Promarca D, Promarca Endo and Promarca ESO to major markets across the world. To achieve this outcome, the company believes that incentivising rewarding performance and the achievement of key objectives through non-cash equity arrangements is the most effective remuneration structure as it preserves the company's cash resources and aligns the interests of employees with those of all shareholders. As a result, we, will make, we make annual offers performance rights to employees and the longer term offers of options to the management team under the incentive performance rights plan and employee incentive options plan respectively. Resolution 8 seeks approval to increase the maximum number of options that may be issued under the employee incentive options plan in accordance with ASX listing rule 7.2 exception 13b. It is not envisaged that 22 million plus options will be issued immediately but the company wishes to retain flexibility to incentivise new and existing employees during the three-year period, following approval by shareholders at this meeting. The proxy votes received for this resolution are as displayed. Are there any questions or comments on this resolution? As there are no questions or comments, we will now move to the next item of business. I now refer to Resolution 9 as set out in the Notice of Meeting and as displayed, which is to amend the existing constitution to increase the issue cap under the Corporations Act from 5% to 20% to allow more securities to be issued under the company's incentive plans over a rolling three-year period. While it is not expected that we will issue 20% of securities under the employee incentive plans during a rolling three-year period, the company wishes to ensure that it has the flexibility to implement appropriate incentive arrangements for the recruitment of additional personnel as business activities expand. The proxy votes received for this resolution are as displayed. Are there any questions or comments on this resolution? Thank you. If there are no questions, we will now move to the polls for the resolution. I declare the polls on resolutions one to nine now open and I appoint Julio Bala from Atomic to be the returning officer. I will now outline the poll procedures. People who are entitled to vote on this poll are all shareholders, proxy holders, and corporate representatives of shareholders. To be eligible to vote, you have to be issued with an attendance and voting card when registering. If there's any person present who believes they're entitled to vote, but they do not have an attendance and voting card, please speak with Julia from Atomic after I've finished outlining the procedures. On the reverse of your attendance and voting card is your poll paper, which details the resolutions for the meeting. Each of resolutions one to nine are being put to this poll. If you are a proxy holder and only have directed votes as shown on the summary of votes attached to your voting card, all you need to do is place it in the ballot box. If you're a proxy holder with open or discretionary, you need to mark a box beside each of resolutions one to nine to indicate how you wish to cast the open votes as either for, against or abstain. All shareholders who have a voting card also need to mark a box beside each of resolutions one to nine to indicate how you wish to cast your votes. When you have finished completing your voting card, please return it to Julio from Atomic. Your vote cannot be counted unless you have lodged your voting card. This includes any proxy holder who only has direct votes. Please advise if you need any assistance. Uh, the meeting will now be held over whilst voting cards are completed and collected. Sorry. 
Does anyone need more time to complete their cards? Well, good. Okay, and added, declare the poll closed. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes the formal business associated with today's meeting. The company will announce the results of the poll to the ASX once the results have been determined. I declare the meeting closed at 9.47. Well done, everyone. As Richard said, on a per-resolution basis, it may be, still be a record. Um, I will now hand the chair over to James, who's been elected the non-executive chairman with effect from the close of this meeting. So congratulations, James. Welcome to the hot seat. Thank you, Neville, um, and thank you for the opportunity of saying a, a few words today. I mean, probably the, the first thing to do is to acknowledge Neville's um, contribution as chair. I know as a very busy man, it's um, it's quite a, an onerous task sometimes to take these things on. So the, the opportunity to to step down and allow me to take the the seat is 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 timely, and I look forward to his counsel um, going forwards um, in in his continuing capacity as a as a non exec director. I'd also obviously like to welcome Aaron formally to the board. Now you're appointed. Um, thank you for coming on board, Aaron. And Aaron's got some great experiences that I think will complement the, the rest of the team. Um, for me personally, I'm, I'm incredibly excited about this opportunity. Richard and I go back quite some time, probably almost 20 years, I think we decided the other day, where as young entrepreneurs, we, we both sort of followed a, a similar but parallel path in, into um, out of science, scientific research and into starting and running companies. Richard's done the hard yards of 23 years in, in one company, I think. Um, I've been through several. Um, my first corporate role in a public company was actually a company called Residence Health that um, Aaron is on the board of, so it's, it's kind of full circle. Um, Residence was a diagnostic company measuring iron levels in the liver using MRI. And it was it was a great privilege and achievement to take that company or that technology from a, a research project through to FDA approval and Australian approval for that matter, and then full commercial launch, including interactions with the pharmaceutical industry in using that diagnostic to, to develop projects. Fast forward about 10 years when I was in the executive chair, or a bit over 10 years probably when I was in the executive chair role at a company called Dimerix that um, is still developing a drug to treat chronic kidney disease. We did some due diligence around a, a little diagnostic um, that was involved in predicting um, diabetic kidney disease as a function of, um, of, of diabetes. And we, we did enter into a collaboration with, with proteomics to potentially look at the, the utility of, of ProMarker D on the background of, of our therapeutic for, for chronic kidney disease. Now, for reasons unrelated to ProMarker D, Dimerix went down the path of, of looking at, a, at an orphan disease of, of chronic kidney disease um, that wasn't related to this project. But suffice to say, I was really excited about what proteomics was doing um, and kept an eye on, on them going forwards. So as my my commitments to Dimerix and, and the fund that I was managing at the time wound down about 18 months ago, the window of opportunity was right for me to, to potentially put my hand up and, and get involved in another company. So I was very pleased and, and grateful for, for Richard introducing me to the board and the company again. So super excited. Um, there's a lot to do. Um, these these companies are never easy. There's always a, a bit of a roller coaster ride for, for all um, early stage biotech companies. But the, the path forward is good. The, the opportunities are great, as, as Richard will tell us about. And um, I might just leave it there. I'm, I'm around for the rest of the morning, so I'm happy to have any chats one-on-one. -on -one. But really excited, and I'm looking forward to working with the board, the management team, and, and the rest of the company. And you know, the, the great thing for me is my daytime job is now almost certainly based in this building, so um, I'll, I'll be very close to the, the company on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's going to be, be great to keep in touch. So look out, Richard. <laughs> So thank you. I'll hand over to Richard.
Thank you, James. Good morning, all. Welcome to those who I have not yet spoken to. Nice to see some uh, um, lots of familiar faces in the room and also some new ones. Uh, I would also like to acknowledge our investor relations um, team that's here, Dirk Van Dissel and Alistair Murray from Candor Advisory. So, so they're here. For those of you on, on the investor shareholder side who haven't met them, um, they'll be around afterwards. They can wave their hands so that uh, you can talk to them. As James said, we're at a very exciting time uh, for what we're doing. And uh, yes, these uh, types of things can be a roller coaster. I'm going to give you a flavor of what we've been doing this year. Uh, it, it's going to be longer than a standard investor presentation. So for the stockbrokers in the room, I'm sorry, this was, will exceed your attention span. Um, nonetheless, we're going to go into a bit of detail because we have a, a really exciting story and a complex one to tell. The standard disclaimer um, about forward-looking statements of which I may make some. You know that we're a medical technology company at the forefront of predictive diagnostics and precision medicine. What's evolved for us now is that we're commercializing three tests, each potentially first-in-class blood tests driven by a proprietary platform technology. We've got ProMarker D for diabetic kidney disease, this is a novel and accurate test for predicting the onset of diabetic kidney disease in patients with type 2 and type 1 diabetes, a disease that affects over 10% of the world's population, and we have good pricing in place in the US. We've got ProMarker Endo for endometriosis. Again, it's a novel and accurate test for diagnosing this disease that affects one in nine women in, um, in Australia, um, costing over $10 billion a year. Uh, really exciting initial data on this test. Promarker ESO for esophageal cancer. Again, a novel, accurate test to diagnose this disease. One in 20 cancer deaths worldwide due to esophageal cancer. And again, really important results that we've been able to generate in the last um, few months. Each of these tests will change the world for these patients that we can treat. We're really, really focused now on getting our tests into, doc doc into doctors' hands so they can get them into patients' hands and we can actually start to make a difference. Brief corporate overview. Our top 40 shareholders own over 40% of the company, so it's still a relatively tightly held register and the, doctor uh, the directors are highly aligned with shareholders. We have good institutional backing, um, including the placement that was at the beginning of this year. We operate from the study laboratory, study of the art laboratories here on the QE2 medical campus. And I invite those of you who haven't seen them, seen them before to have a tour afterwards and see our facilities. We have very high levels of accreditation. 17025 is a technical accreditation relating to providing chemical testing. 13485 is a manufacturing accreditation for the products that we generate. They both speak to the quality of the services and the research that we do. These underpin our specialist technology platform, which analyzes proteins. Our analytical services business targets pharmacokinetics, which is related to clinical trials, as well as biosimilars, which are drugs used in immunotherapy treatments. We are a revenue generating business from the bioanalytical services, and that cash flow helps offset our burn from the R&D and the, and the commercial development of our tests. We're looking forward to the point where the ProMarker D, ProMarker Endo and ProMarker ESO revenue comes into the equation and we can start to point to that in that total figure of 2.7 million for FY25 for total income. Our cash burn is tight, $1.5 million per quarter. We are well funded for what we're going to be talking about today in terms of the things that we're, we're doing. Yes, it's been uh, a little bit of a roller coaster ride with the share price this year as we've had good news and uh, challenges. That's part of the process. We're looking forward to the growth of the share price in uh, the months and, and years ahead as we start to deliver on the tests that we have. 
So this is the, the key slide really for where we're at today and what we're focused on as an organization. The science is proven. It's the commercialization that is now underway and this is the, the core focus for us. We have over 20 years R&D experience resulting in a deep pipeline that underpins these three tests at the commercial um, ready stage. Each of those tests services large unmet medical needs. The tests will save lives and improve the quality of life for patients. It's going to save health. Each test can save healthcare systems billions of dollars. Each of the tests has very broad market appeal. Pharmaceutical companies developing drugs in these areas, the clinical pathology labs who can run the tests, the diagnostic platform developers, the big instrument players who put tests like ours into the hands of the hospitals around the world. And then obviously the physicians and the patients who are the real target audience for our tests. What has changed and what is really exciting as an opportunity for us now as a company is the way that new specialized tests like ours can be brought to market. This simply wasn't an opportunity three or four years ago. The changes to the regulatory pathways, the adoption of more technology and making that technology more readily taken into the laboratory is new and it's something that we can take advantage of. So the CLEAR is a particular badge, clinical laboratory badge in the US that certifies laboratories so that they can run tests. There are hundreds of thousands of these tests that, of these labs in the US and we're looking to work with these laboratories um, and I'll expand more on that. In Australia, the path is known as, known as ISO 15189. This is the clinical accreditation akin to the accreditations we've already got. Um, similar in the um, Europe, where it's known as an in-house in vitro diagnostic. <clears throat> and the um, generic term for the path to market in the US is a laboratory developed test. Each of these paths are alternatives to dealing with the Therapeutic Goods Administration or the Federal uh, Drug Administration. They're tested a uh, their paths that are specific for bringing innovative tests to market, and we're going to use these paths. We can do this because we have the expertise to develop uh, the tests onto um, platforms that can be adopted into reference laboratories. We are excellent at setting up laboratory skills, getting the accreditation required. And so our real focus <clears throat> at the moment is to establish specialized reference laboratories in the US, here in Australia, <clears throat> and um, in Europe to be able to run our tests. We're not breaking completely new ground, but we're certainly at the front of it. So C2N Diagnostics is a nice example of what can be done in this area. Very similar technology to ours. This is a test for Alzheimer's um, that, that started to come through and being brought out with exactly the path that I've just described. They're a really nice example of a path to revenue for tests like ours, and it's the path that we intend to follow. And what's overlaid with this is the cost-effective routes to market that have been brought in on the back of the pandemic, which has changed the landscape for what is possible for organizations like ours and for patients to get access to tests. It allows us to take our tests direct to the patient. We can use telemedicine. We can provide the consults to the patients. There's a full ecosystem in place to connect all the dots in that supply chain effectively so that a patient can go from looking a test up to getting a blood test, having the blood sample taken in, in that process, having that delivered to the lab. All of that now exists as a route. Simply wasn't there a few years ago. The advantage of going down this path is that we have much greater control over the process. There's potential for much greater share of the revenue on the back of that. And it's also a capital light process compared to the traditional way of having um, dozens or hundreds of salespeople on the ground. So it, it's a very affordable process. And again, one that we've um, been really focused on over the last 12 months for how we can deliver on this. So I want to focus on why we're working on these areas, the problems that we have 
why we're targeting diabetic kidney disease, endometriosis, and esophageal cancer. So over 500 million people worldwide with diabetes. 32 million in the US alone, one and a half million in Australia. These are our target audiences. Endometriosis, for those of you not so familiar with that, that's when tissue from the uterus grows into other organs where it doesn't belong. It's a very painful condition, difficult to diagnose. It can take several years to diagnose, in fact, and it's something that we know that we can change. We need to bring our blood test to market as soon as possible. As I said before, one in nine women affected by this condition, potentially more, and from a very early age. It's, it's a disease now that's recognized that can start in the teenage years. It's a very important um, test that we're really focused on bringing through as quickly as we can. Esophageal cancer, very different condition. Um, this is the um, um, his and hers part of the story. So the hers test is endometriosis. The esophageal cancer tends to affect middle-aged white men. And, and so we're, we're trying to be equal in all that we do. Um, esophageal cancer is currently diagnosed by sticking a pipe down the throat and, and then taking a biopsy off that. Um, hundreds of uh, thousands of biopsies performed um, around the world in the US alone, um, 1.5 million endoscopies trying to pick up this cancer. They're not very good. They're very, very difficult to, to uh, detect the, te the actual condition. They get missed. And I'll talk more to this later, but ultimately this cancer is killing a lot of people and it's getting worse. And we have a blood test that could fix this problem. So the solutions that we have are free blood tests. It's about precision medicine so we can target these unmet medical needs. Diabetes kills people because it leads to dialysis, um, or at least a kidney disease, which can lead to dialysis, kidney transplant. Very expensive. Current standard of care is simply not up to the job. It cannot tell who has kidney disease until the symptoms are already quite severe. Our tests can predict the disease up to four years in advance. And the recent data we have shows that it also works on type 1 diabetes. So this is about 10% of the diabetes population, um, a very proactive group. And it's exciting that the test works in that group as well. It opens up a new market opportunity for us. And importantly, for diabetic kidney disease, there are therapeutic treatments available. When we started on our journey, and, and James alluded to that with the, the um, companies like Dimerix developing drugs in this area, very difficult to develop drugs for um, kidney disease. The GLP-1 agonist, agonists are a new class of drugs that are coming through that may have ap application in this area, um, most known as Ozempic. But the canagliflozin class, or the sorry, the gliflozin class, exemplified by canagliflozin and empagliflozin drugs, known as SGLT2 inhibitors, these drugs are now approved for diabetic kidney disease. They're originally prescribed for diabetes, but they're now being um, used for for kidney disease. And we've got really nice data to show the benefit of um, patients going on these drugs early. So we're looking at launching ProMarketE in Australia in Q1 of next calendar year and in the US in the first half of next calendar year. As I said, endometriosis uh, is a condition that takes a long time to diagnose. The standard of care is invasive surgery, um, a laparoscopy and incision through the abdomen. Uh, it's why that procedure is why diagnosis takes such a long time. Doctors are not willing to prescribe that approach, particularly in uh, in young women and girls. We have a potential world first blood test, and obviously the the community interest in this uh, in this area, the recognition that we have a serious problem to treat, is now it's current. Um, we are at the front of this area of research in terms of developing a new um, diagnostic. It, it's great to see others. Um, in the competition, there's other tests that are start, we're starting to see um, coming through. None of them are a simple blood test, um, but there's there's ones that are coming. Um, ours, ours is looking best in class, and we're looking to launch this test in Australia in Q2 of next calendar year. As I said, esophageal cancer is a nasty, um, a nasty cancer. Five-year survival rate less than twenty percent. The majority of people either don't know they've got it, 
until it's too late. The tests simply don't pick things up. The standard of care for this is costly. It's a day procedure. Uh, so there's obviously just the inconvenience. And again, given this generally affects males more, um, probably because males are not so quite so willing to get off the backside and do something about it. Um, the reality is that we have a solution here that is is a simple one, um, a screening test that you can say these patients have the have the disease. I'm looking to launch this test in Australia in Q1 of next calendar year and, and in the US um, shortly after that. Uh, it will be as soon, uh, as soon as we can. So what is our path to market for our tests? This is um, an important slide in terms of how we're pursuing our go-to-market strategies for our suites of tests. These are our paths to revenue. There is the traditional licensing model where we license our technology to a, a diagnostics lab or equivalent, and we provide them with the reagents. They can run the test, upload the results to our um, algorithms, which sit in uh, the cloud, and that can generate a report back to the patients. And we'd get a royalty on every test that's sold. And that's still a very viable route. It's one that we're still looking at pursuing, but in parallel with a direct-to-consumer, direct-to-patient and digital health strategy. We're pursuing that um, direct-to-consumer path because we can control it better. We're in the process of uh, establishing a, a reference laboratory that clinical grade um, here in Perth for the tests that we have and working on establishing these laboratories in the US as well. Then it's a matter of telehealth consult, the laboratory connection services that can then enable a patient to get a blood sample taken, provide that sample through to the laboratory, and then the results provided back through to the consulting physician. It's a, it's a new path that simply wasn't there. The output for us could be much greater revenue from each of the tests that we sell. The objective of these um, paths is first sales for each of our tests. We are going to be able to generate much more interest in our tests once we've got first sales and tests on market. That's the area that we're really focused on now, it's first sales. So to go into a little bit more detail on that launch strategy for direct-to-patient, it's about building product awareness, having a test so that key opinion leaders can order it, and then building volume so we can position our tests as the key tool for patients and physicians. That's step one, engaging the patients, about direct advertising um, in terms of making patients aware that there are options if you have diabetic kidney disease, endometriosis, or soft cancer. What can you do about it? Engaging with patient advocacy groups, nurse practitioners, motivating the patients then to understand their disease and making it easy for them to access the tests, getting that telehealth consult. And then in step three, providing the patient access, reducing the barriers, making it easy to get that blood sample taken and um, results back to the patient. This is about driving and growing sales, building market awareness, and it's a path that particularly lends itself to certain audiences. So um, highly, motivated, highly motivated patient groups, like we see with type 1 diabetes patients who really um, are aware of their condition, that know what to do, that are really keen to manage their diabetes well, uh, obviously, endometriosis is a very highly motivated patient group as well. So, so this strategy really lends itself um, to those types of, of groups. Uh, the, the targeted approach for the, um, the different audiences is what we're focused on. Ultimately, it's about creating a buzz for the tests so that we can expand it into other areas. At the bottom, it's laying out the steps in more detail. You can read this at your leisure. Uh, um, later if you wish to look it up online but the point is that this process can be done in in minutes uh, same day type exercise consults can happen very quickly the patient can get a result very quickly it changes a process from taking months to taking days and weeks it opens up a new route to bring things through and it's one that we're well advanced in terms of the processes required to, to adopt this path in Australia and subsequently in the US.
So I'm going to take a step back now just to explain what our platform technology is and how we use it. What is our point of difference? So the ProMarker platform lets us identify a unique fingerprint of proteins that we can find circulating in the blood. So if we get people with a disease and people without, based on that different molecular fingerprint that we can see, we can identify which patients have the disease. That lets us generate new intellectual property. That lets us create novel diagnostic tests. It's the intellectual property that we can then sell. We now have a pipeline of, um, of tests coming through. We've always targeted areas of significant unmet medical need where the existing standard of care isn't good enough, in our opinion, where there's enormous market opportunities and revenue potential. So today, I'm going to focus in more detail on ProMarker D, ProMarker Endo, and ProMarker ESO. But we have tests coming through for oxidative stress, which affect, affects many other conditions, and also looking at other areas of diabetes. As I said, we've got exciting and new results on type 1 diabetes, also looking at asthma and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease through to um, plant dieback uh, and parasitic infection, giardia. So the range of things that we um, have further up our pipeline, uh, we're really focused on the back end now of that clinical validation and getting our tests into the commercialization to get them across that finishing line. Now, I'm not going to go into all the details on this slide. It's merely to illustrate the huge volume of work, the body of work that supports the pro-market test and how we've got it to this point of market readiness and and what is key to the process for pro-market D. And we're following the same steps for our other tests. So obviously, the intellectual property is paramount and we have patents granted for pro-market D. The regulatory side, we have regulatory approval in, in Europe. And so we're going down appropriate pathways for the tests in our other markets. The manufacturing scale-up is a really important part of the ProMarker D journey because and that's how we re-engineered our tests from the sophisticated platform that we use in our laboratories upstairs onto a, a more mainstream process. That took two to three years to do, and we won't be doing this for ProMarker Endo and ProMarker ESO. So it's a really important step um, that we can now bypass and we can bypass this because of our technology and because of the, of the changes in the regulatory landscape so this is a why we can bring our new test to market much more quickly with all of our tests it's very important to have peer review and and key opinion leaders recognizing the quality of the data and that's one of our strengths and and we're very pleased to work with Janssen and part of Johnson and Johnson for and um, one of our validation studies on on pro market e that really showed how strong that test is, and, and we're following similar paths for our other tests. Uh, um, engaging with physicians to show that they want to order the test, um, outperforming standard of care. The, the key for ProMarker D is we can identify 84% of the patients who go on to develop diabetic kidney disease in four years, and current standard of care can't do any. Uh, so it's points of difference like that that really show why our test matters and why patients are very keen to get access to our test. When we present these results at, at industry conferences, we have an awful lot of interest in, in getting the tests uh, to them. And so that's why we're really focused on getting our labs established. We can generate lots of data to show the economic health benefit. Um, we all know uh, um, that dialysis is a very expensive exercise. Uh, the costs for that around the world are huge. If we can stop people moving on to that path, even by delaying it for 10 years, we're going to save healthcare systems uh, billions of dollars, as well as the convenience for the patient. I said there are now therapeutics available. Um, it's all about prevention is better than cure, intervening before the diseases are chronic and making that difference so that we can change the lives of patients and improve um, the efficiency of healthcare systems. And the breakthrough study at the bottom, um, type 1 diabetes that I mentioned, we actually have higher accuracy for this um, test on type 1 diabetes than we originally achieved on type 2 diabetes. And so we're looking forward to exploring that a little bit more just to confirm that, but it's a very important result and shows just the quality of the pro market -E test for predicting the onset of kidney disease. We're focused on our existing partnerships um, to achieve first sales in each jurisdiction, European Union, as I said, we have CE Mark. Um, so we're, we're focused on how we can establish an independent reference laboratory in Europe. We have partners through 
um, number of countries in Europe. We have Growth Medics, who are our sales agency that we appointed earlier this year, um, targeting the Benelux countries. Um, we have Eurobio in France, doing a lot of work with them to understand the best route to market in these countries in terms of reimbursement pathways and appropriate reference laboratories that we can work with. Similar um, aspect in the UK, where our test is registered um, through various bodies with the National Health Service. And again, our focus is on establishing reference laboratories so that we can get the test available and then work out, um, make it available so that other groups can get access to that um, test and they can start running samples. We don't normally talk a lot about our market in uh, Central America, um, Puerto Rico, uh, Dominican Republic, and now extended to Chile. But our partner there, Omics Global Solutions, uh, are a very innovative company. Uh, they have called the, their version of, of our ProMarketD that they've licensed in Abadia, um, highlighting what, where they see the focus. The importance here is that this has been a really good beta test site for us to show what can be done with the test. Uh, um, it's helped us refine the the software side and how we can provide that through um, to laboratories. First sales have commenced there. And because Puerto Rico is a territory of the US, the uh, reimbursement that we have in place in the US is something that, that they can actually utilize. So through our partners there, we're looking forward to hearing how they go with getting public reimbursement and enga engaging with insurers to get coverage for the test in Puerto Rico, because that will definitely give good indication of what we can achieve with ProMarketE in the US itself. And so let me talk to ProMarketE in the US and where we sit today. So that despite the challenges that we've had, the test is now enormously de-risked and it is commercial ready. And we've achieved uh, critical milestones in the process. The US has over 32 million people with diabetes. On the back of the work that we've done, we have a unique proprietary laboratory analysis code for the test, which is a, a point uh, um, where insurers and, and groups can code the test so that they can reimburse it. And this PLA code, as it's known, is something that we can crosswalk future versions of the test to. So this is a really critical validation of the test to show that it it's of merit, that the US healthcare system will adopt a test like this and that we can provide it to patients. Equally important, we've achieved Centers for Medicare and Medicaid pricing of $391. Um, that's the benchmark pricing for payers into the future. So that's, that's the price that we're um, working um, towards for um, launching the test in the US. And again, that's a vindication of the value of the test that that price is set um, by the healthcare services there. Our current focus is on that tech transfer to clear certified laboratory. We have all the systems in place. Um, we've established our um, ProMarket assay on automated systems up in our laboratory here and um, currently working on how we transfer that most efficiently into the US. We put in place a world-class clinical advisory board who are very keen to see the test available so that they can start recommending it um, to their patients and to their colleagues. This is where our hybrid go-to-market strategy comes in. And the whole purpose of this is to target first sales. If we get the reference lab sorted out, and that's something we're looking to do um, in the next few months, we have a path to coding, we have a path to pricing, we have a path to reimbursement. We need to get the test available, and that's what the um, the strategy is uh, is really focused on. The other critical element to this um, process for ProMarketD is that we can do exactly the same thing for our other tests. So the laboratory that we set up will be a reference laboratory in due course for the other tests. That the experiences and the learnings that we have from ProMarketD can be used to get coding and, and reimbursement for our other tests as well. So this is really accelerating the path to market for other tests and why we've gone from talking about ProMarket Endo and ProMarket ESO as research tests a year ago to tests that could be in the clinic by this time next year. So let me go into more detail on endometriosis. I should have said, feel free to ask questions, but you can all devoutly reading the screens. So 
the endometriosis test, the, it's about understanding which patients have the disease, which patients have symptoms, and and which are um, um, which are healthy. So if we compare those groups, a symptomatic patient has pelvic pain, but when surgically diagnosed, they don't have endometriosis. So that's when specialist has um, done that lapar laparoscopy. They've inserted the um, the camera in through the abdomen. They've had looked around, they have not been able to identify any endometriosis, any tissue in other parts of the body cavity. Compared to endometriosis patients where in, uh, um, the tissue was actually observed and that can um, grade from, from minimal through to mild, moderate and severe. So our prototype test identify 90% of patients with the disease and we do have patents pending in all the major jurisdictions. What was um, important to recognize uh, and we said at the time that our prototype test did have limitations in diagnosing patients with mild forms of the disease. How could we tell somebody with severe symptoms um, from those, a patient that, that had mild endometriosis? Our team has done a lot of work with advanced statistical modeling so that we can start to distinguish those symptomatic groups from mild and, and um, minimal endometriosis. And we do have clinical results that have been submitted for peer and review publication and we look forward to the um, response to that and to sharing that data um, once it's completed that peer review process. Part of this journey is about optimizing how we analyze our patients. So I, I didn't talk about this in any detail previously, um, but we use a traffic light system. If you've looked at our reports for ProMarker D, if you're in the red zone in our test, you're in real trouble. If you're in the green zone in our test, we have a 98% rule out rate that you're not in real trouble. And then the amber zone is where we need to, to look at patients in more detail. We can apply this way of looking to all of our patients so that we can give as much surety as possible that some patients are without disease, some patients are with disease. And it's been a very effective tool uh, for improving the accuracy of our tests. The methodology behind Promarker Endo is very sophisticated and we're currently adapting that so that it can be um, ready for clinical launch. And as I indicated, establishing reference laboratories uh, in other parts of the world to bring ProMarket E forward. We're in discussions about how we can do that, but we're really focused on launching the test in Australia as soon as possible. And so um, we're targeting specialist accreditation, as I said before, with a view to launching in Q2. Along the way, we work with some of the best groups in the world on this, Royal Women's Hospital, um, and the University of Melbourne have the one of the biggest studies for endometriosis in the world and certainly the biggest in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, the group at the University of Oxford is um, one of two groups in the UK and, and three in the Northern Hemisphere that are world-renowned in this area. And we're really focused with working on the best uh, so that we can demonstrate the, the power of our, um, of our test and We'll, we'll share results from, from future studies as we go, but the real focus now is on getting that test available so we have an early path to revenue. And the esophageal cancer, uh, very similar story, potential world first blood test, and this one is ready for commercialization. Um, we asked the question, can we dis distinguish somebody who's healthy from somebody with esophageal adenocarcinoma to give the cancer its full name? And as I indicated before, current screening is not very good. So uh, esophageal cancer tends to come from acid reflux. That's a broad statement. And we generally as a community don't, or as a medical community, don't understand where esophageal adenocarcinoma comes from. Um, it says 50% of patients are missed. Um, even those who are, are screened, 25% of esophageal adenocarcinomas are misdiagnosed. So there's a real market opportunity here for an accurate blood test. And the data we have presented recently is phenomenally good. Um, as a scientist, um, we, we look for our data very critically and the results that we've had across three studies where we have accuracy above 90% in three different cohorts is very exciting. And it's a reason why we're um, looking to bring the test to market as soon as we can. And we do have patents granted already in Europe, China, Australia with US pending. Uh, we continue to optimize the method um, using that similar traffic light system, but we got very good feedback when we presented these results at the World Congress for Esophageal Diseases uh, in Scotland uh, um, in September. Uh, 
that method has already been adopted for uh, uh, sorry, adapted for clinical launch of final refinements going on as we and get our laboratory to that clinical certification stage. And, and once that's achieved and uh, um, subject to, to climbing over the right hurdles, then we will launch this test in Q1 of next calendar year. And again, working with some of the world best groups on that, uh, um, ProbeNet is a, is a very broad Australian study. Oshner is a big group in the US. And we continue to engage with appropriate groups around the world who have cohorts, a very big uh, study on esophageal cancer out of the UK. And, uh, and we're engaged with how we might work with them to bring our tests to market in that part of the world. Don't normally talk a lot about a software, um, about oxidative stress and, and this test. Um, this one is complex um, by anybody's standards. Um, so it's a specialist product. It's in late stage development. It's got a lot of opportunity. Um, the, the broad summation of it is we're all human beings that breathe breathe oxygen and so if anything goes wrong in that process there's some oxidative stress happens so almost every disease that occurs has got an oxidative stress component so this test has potentially very broad applicability and working in with our collaborators at the university of western australia we've managed to develop a means of, of measuring this oxidative stress this test has been uh, evolved into something as simple as a finger prick test uh, a dry blood spot that can be um uh, tested we have a um, <clears throat> patents in place and a number of peer-reviewed publications already out and, and coming. What we're focused on in terms of bringing it to market is using the technology for muscle damage. We did initial studies on Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, which is a muscle wasting disease, and that um, generated very powerful results to show that this test could pick up subtleties in that disease. We see applications of applying that technology to look at athletic performance, be that in athletes or in the horse racing industry. And we have proof of concept studies that we're finalizing. And this is an exciting um, technology that we're looking um, for how we can best commercialize it. As you observe, we have a lot going on. Uh, and so um, this one has uh, uh, sat further down in our pipeline, uh, but it's at the stage where we're looking for um, how we may bring it forward faster in discussions with third parties about investments on that. I'm not going to dwell on this slide. This is a record of everything we've done this year, uh, and it uh, talks to um, how we brought our test through from uh, um, the processes around patenting, partnering, and generating new results. But the focus is really on the future. What are the multiple drivers for this financial year and then beyond the potential share price catalysts um, through 2025? We absolutely recognize its first sales in the US are a, a critical point. Launching ProMarketD in Australia is part of that strategy, working with our partners to launch ProMarketD in Europe. In parallel with that, bringing ProMarket Endo through in, in Q2 of next year, ProMarket ESO in Q1. They're the commercial milestones, that path to revenue that we are on and that we can see uh, as very achievable. The clinical and technical as aspects uh, I've spoken to as I indicated, the endometriosis results um, were currently subject to peer review. The esophageal cancer results we've already presented, and we'll have an update on the oxidative um, uh, stress test, OxyDX, this quarter. This will be supported by appropriate regulatory and reimbursement paths uh, so that we can make the test available to as broad an audience as possible. As I indicated, we've got specialist paths that we can use for early adoption, and then we can broaden that with uh, endo and ESO using an FDA breakthrough path. Ultimately, we have an exceptional opportunity. Our technology platform is disruptive and it's gonna let us develop new tests in the future, but we're currently focused on the tests that we have. ProMarketD has been de-risked and patented and it is revenue ready. The endo and ESO tests are also nearing market entry. They are scalable with high margins and they do have whole of market appeal from the pharmaceutical companies through to patients. It's a very vibrant sector where we see a lot of opportunity for engaging with that. And I say our focus is on, on doing our job properly. Getting the test into the hands of, of patients is, is the current strategy. It's what we're really focused on. And we're looking to deliver on that in the coming months. 
So with, with that, I will thank you for your attention and just finish um, with acknowledging um, one of our colleagues, John Dunlop, who um, was involved in the foundation of the company and who died in December of last year. Uh, so John was a great character and uh, um, he, uh, He'll be missed by all, all who knew him, and he uh, certainly uh, um, wouldn't take lightly to um, us missing any deadlines. So um, I apologise to him for that. Thank you. Are there any questions? Surely, Conrad, you can... <laughs> Yeah, orange means we have less certainty. And so um, you know, ultimately you end up with a score from our tests and, and it's a probability of having the disease. So we like to be able to, to rule things in and rule things out. And that's the primary objective. If we're, if we're not sure, um, then that, that orange test means we've got to explore a bit more, that orange result rather. And so then we're looking at, um, when we say explore a bit more, potentially we can look at more details with the patient and see whether we can tease that out a bit further. But in the first instance, the intention is a simple blood test. Yes, that we say you do or you don't. Um, it, sometimes it's not possible to be 100% certain. Yeah, thank you. Well, it's a different way around. So um, the patients that we're envisaging seeing will be before they've had that diagnosis. So the problem with what you've just described is that for a doctor to be able to say you've got minimal or, or severe is the patient's already had to have surgery. And and the doctors are reluctant to do that. So there can be a five-year wait, seven-year wait before that happens. So the objective of our test is to say, we believe this patient has endometriosis. Now we need to work out how we're going to treat it. So that may still involve um, surgery and, and the various treatments that um, laser ablation that can be done with that. But it's about, about then going in for that patient and saying, we need to treat this patient because they the test says they have endometriosis, as opposed to another patient where we say we, they don't have endometriosis and we need to figure out what else is going on. So that's the real objective is that, that screen to give peace of mind one way or the other. And, and that's re really where the power of the test sits. Uh, just a couple of questions, really on the commercial side. Of sure. Firstly, uh, uh, the cash firm and uh, you know where you how comfortable you are about um, sort of managing the cash uh, and uh, because of the limited income. Uh, and then on the other side, or, or the relevance of that, really um, maybe where you see the company in five years' time, or, or something like that, just to give us some sort of idea of. Uh, I mean, there's, there's a huge potential coming down the, down the track, we understand that, but just what that looks like uh, in one or two or whatever years' time. Yes. So the um, just repeat the questions for the purposes of the um, microphone on that. So the in terms of the cash burn, uh, we run a tight operation, and what we're talking about in terms of uh, setting up laboratories and the strategy for direct-to-consumer, direct-to-patient, very affordable processes that we understand well in terms of the lab and and that we're using experts um, to work with for that consumer-driven um, digital health side. So the cash that we have at Bank lets us lets us do that. We um, with the runway that we have and there's five, five million in the bank with it, two mil R and D coming and uh, with a burn that we have that gives us a 12 month runway with no revenue um that's the uh, um that's the worst case scenario if we start to get our tests available then we can obviously um alleviate that uh, we're we're conscious of the cash position and, and and using the the funds tightly now obviously the opportunity for the tests is is huge and 
clearly that was the frustration for us of not being able to move quickly in markets like the US before. Uh, um, even in Australia, that there was not a path to bringing our tests through. So what we're focused on now, as I said, is getting the test available so that we can get that first sale, which will lead to the 10th sale, which will lead to the thousandths and then the hundred thousandths and from on, on from there. For each of the tests that we're looking at, there are multi-million dollar opportunities. There are certainly millions of people who need the tests. Previously, we have not focused on that sale aspect that we've looked at our uh, partners to do that. We'll still rely on our partners to do that in due course but we want to make it a bit easier for everybody by getting the test available and so that our key opinion leaders, be that for diabetes or endometriosis or esophageal cancer, they can each say, this test is available in this lab, go and get it. And then they can talk to their colleagues about that. So where will we be in five years time? If we're correct um, with un understanding the demand that we see and the feedback we've already had on our tests, there's scope for, for getting substantial market penetration in that five-year window. Now, uh, not going to give predictions on that but because the, the numbers become telephone numbers very quickly. But obviously, we're all here because we believe what can be done. And we, we know that the science works. And we've now identified a path to market, which we hadn't identified previously. So I think this opens up a door uh, and let, lets us really... And um, position ourselves for, for an exciting ride in the next couple of years. Any other questions? Okay, I'm not going to force you. Um, there's, um, if you'd like a lab tour, if you haven't seen our facilities, um, Scott's going to stand up and wave. Um, so, well, sit up and wave. Um, so um, please uh, have a chat with Scott and we can take you around our, our laboratories and show you the automation systems that we have in place for Primarca D and the sophisticated instruments that we use to run the Primarca Endo and Primarca ESO tests. We'd be very pleased to show you those and that they'll be the ones that are set up in um, other parts of the world in due course. And, and um, if all goes to plan, be running um, patient samples here um, in 2025. I invite you otherwise to uh, um, come and enjoy a uh, cup of tea and a, and a biscuit. And thank you very much for your um, patience and for, for um, being here.